Hello everyone, how's it going? This is Jason from Story Basilisk, back again for another coding stream. So today we're going to do something which we quite rarely do, which is pick up where we left off and build something on top of uh, what we put together in the previous stream. So we run our usual Twitter poll and just barely edging out the Twitch chat chess overlay game was this isometric puzzle game. Uh, and since last week we built this isometric grid renderer, which I actually have up and running right here. This little thing where I can, uh, we draw this tile map and I can hover around and place tiles and stuff like that. Right now that's all it is, I can just place things and it's a little map editor and renderer, I guess. So the idea is to turn this into some kind of actual playable puzzle game, which is something we didn't really, you know, didn't get around to. It was kind of out of the scope of the previous week stream. Um, yeah, I have a kind of idea for a kind of game we can turn this into. But if anyone in chat has any suggestions, then we can certainly tweak that and maybe try and go in another direction. I should say that if you did catch the previous stream or watch the VOD, I have made a couple of small changes to this code. Um, you notice this nice hand cursor. A little peek behind the scenes. I put this in there to make the GIFs, which I post about these coding streams because uh, the mouse cursor doesn't come out in those GIFs for whatever reason, so I put this cute little hand cursor in. Maybe I'll take that out, maybe I'll leave it in. I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk quickly through the changes I've done. The first one is that I've added a load more um, terrain types in here. So if we look in the folder, there's basically just more stuff. So I think previously we just had the plain grass and these like river tiles. I've added a load of road tiles and some little corner edgy in betweeny tiles you need to make things line up and look nice together. It just gives us a bit more stuff to play with to make more of an interesting little world here. Uh, so that's the first change. Those have just gone in this big list at the top of the program, which kind of uh, tells the program all of the assets it needs to load. Um, we load those all in the kind of setup function. If you're not familiar with processing, there's this setup function which runs once at the start of the program where we create the window. We load this hand. You know what? I'm going to get rid of that because it's just kind of weird. Um, <laughs> there's also some, some extra code for crafting this GIF, which I'm going to kind of strip out as we go through. Uh, but we have this set of tile images. We have this world. Uh, then in our main draw function, we kind of clear the background. We have some camera controls with the arrow keys. We then kind of apply those to kind of shift our viewpoint position. And then we just go through and draw all of the tiles. So we loop through the y and x coordinates which comprise the whole world um yeah and then we draw the tiles we loop in this particular way so that we draw like the far away tiles first and then the nearer tiles in front so that when we have overlaps like you know if this tile is kind of nearer to the camera than this one then the the, the spiky bit should be drawn like on top of this one as opposed to like getting weirdly overlapped underneath it so that's kind of all these loops do for us um, and then if the tile is the currently hovered tile, we kind of highlight it in red. Otherwise, we just color it normally uh, in white. So if you tint something white in processing, it's the same as drawing it in its original unaltered form. Uh, then I draw the hand, which I do no longer need to do. And then I have a little thing here which dumps out uh, the screen to a file. This, this is how I make the GIF. Um, Processing has this really nice built-in function called save frame. We give it something like this, and it, every time you call it, it will spit out like frame 0001, 0002, and so on. So to capture the GIF, I made something where if I press spacebar, it toggles this capture flag on, and then it starts dumping out the frames, but we no longer need that. Hopefully this now compiles. Yep, seems to be okay. The other thing I did, which is something I kind of talked about doing but never got around to in the last stream, was improving the code for determining uh, which tile our mouse is over. And this was only the, honestly the most complex part of this. There's a little bit of maths involved. But, um, uh, yeah, so I can kind of explain how that works. So the previous way we did it is we would go through every tile, calculate its kind of central position, and then just keep track of whichever one is closest to the mouse, which works just fine. But as the map gets bigger, 
you're doing all this extra work, you're looping over every single tile in the world just to calculate the distance of each of them from the mouse, when really there should be a way, a nice clean mathematical way to figure out, given uh, the mouse position, like what, just tell me directly what coordinates in the world I'm over, that should be something you can do. Uh, and indeed, when the pressure of the stream had ended and I had some time to get out a piece of paper, I figured that out and I replaced this horrible set of loops with something a bit cleaner and I can I think I can now kind of explain uh, how this works. This is going to be the most probably the most math heavy part of this whole stream and it's coming right at the beginning so I apologize for that but you know I think it's actually kind of useful. The purpose of the previous stream was about how we do isometric rendering and figuring out mapping between the coordinates on the screen and the coordinates in your 3D world is kind of the key part of that so it makes sense that we figure out how the heck to actually do it. So we have our isometric world, which is going to get drawn a bit squiffily, but please forgive me. And we decided that this was kind of our zero zero tile, if you like. This is coming out relatively, <laughs> relatively okay. We determined, we'd sort of arbitrarily decided we're going to call this our zero, zero coordinate. And then this is one, zero, this is two, zero, meaning our X coordinates increase like that and our Y coordinates increase like that. So this is zero, one, zero, two, this is one, one, this is two, two, and so on. Uh, and given that this is how the world is defined, we had used the concept of, I'd called it a stride, um, which is to say that every time our X coordinate increases, the actual screen position of the tile doesn't increase. You know, if our screen is like this, wow, that was supposed to be a rectangle. If our screen is like this, then actually X is like straight horizontal and Y is straight vertical. But to account for this, perspective and rotation, we said that every time our world X increases, we actually move kind of from here to here, right? You know, if X increases again, we take that same little vector and we just add it on again and that gets our new kind of position. So given any tile, if you want to move along one in the X axis, you kind of apply this little step. Wow. This little step, right? This little triangular offset. So even though our, it's only our x coordinate that's increasing, there's actually an x and a y component to how that affects the position on the screen. And then similarly, if we're going in the y direction, then it's instead it's this little vector, this little step we apply. And that's always the same, right? If you want to increase our y coordinate by one from here, then we apply that same little step, this thing here. Yeah, so we have what I called an X stride and a Y stride. Um, so if you want to figure out, given any position on the screen, which tile does that correspond to? Um, ultimately, what you need to figure out is there's some combination of these adding on these little X strides, which are like this kind of vector, and these Y strides, which are like this kind of vector. X stride, Y stride. Um, some combination of those together will, will land on any given point, right? So if I'm like this point here, then it's some number of X strides, some number of Y strides will kind of land exactly on this point, And that will give me the coordinate, which is going to be what, like three, one, and then, you know, slightly off of the center point of three, one here. Um, And what you essentially get is some formula, which is, you know, our x coordinate multiplied by our, our x stride plus the y coordinate multiplied by our y stride is going to be equal to um, equal to our, our mouse x and mouse y, right?
Um, yeah, and then you kind of have to un unpack this and figure out what values of x and you know you know the mouse x and y. That's kind of the input to this, and you need to figure out the values of x and y in the world, which will kind of combine with these strides to like line you up on the mouse cursor's position. And I figured out that a way to simplify this is rather than thinking about these strides, it kind of helps instead to sort of divide the world up into a grid. So let me undo a load of this stuff. Basically it gets awkward because an x stride has both an x and a y component inside of it, but you can kind of simplify that by thinking of the world in terms of a grid, something like this. Where you'd have this regular spacing that kind of lines up with the, the tiles here, and then similarly in the other axis. And now you can see we're already some way towards transforming this world to be more like our screen, which is just a nice, regular, aligned rectangle with nice right angles everywhere. Um, and what I did was I called this little spacing, I called it uh, an X step. And then this little spacing here, I called it a Y step. Um, and then you can rewrite the same kind of thing in a slightly different way. You can say that um, x times by x step minus y times by x step is equal to, that's not what equal signs looks like, is equal to mouse x. Right, what we're saying is for every x in the world, we're going to kind of go across one of these, right? As x increases, okay, we kind of move diagonally from 0, 0 to 1, 0, but the x coordinate just increases by, by this amount. And no matter where you are in the world, that's true. If you go from 0, 2 to this tile is 1, 2, then you're kind of going to go from this position over to this kind of row. Uh, and then it's the same kind of thing for y, where uh, oh, x times y step plus, please behave tablet, y times x, oh no, y step equals Moose Y, that's supposed to be you. <laughs> equals mouse Y. Because whether, whenever we, we go up either in X or Y, then we're kind of moving down the screen, right? So as our X coordinate increases, going from 0, 0 to say 1, 0, then we're also kind of stepping down. You know, to get to this, from this tile to this one, with our, our Y coordinate is increasing, we're going down one Y step. And it's the same for Y. If our Y coordinate increases, we go sort of this way. But again, our Y coordinate on the screen on this nice rectangular grid also kind of goes down uh, by one. Yeah, so you, you now get this relationship between X and Y, and you can do a little bit of uh, reorganizing of these equations. Uh, what did I call it? Okay, I called it X strides. Um, So all this is doing is calculating how many of these little horizontal steps we've taken. So we take the difference between the position we're trying to query for and the kind of root position of the world, and we just divide it by uh, this x step to get the number of x strides across we've taken. And similarly for y, we calculate the offset. Uh, there's a little fudge factor to account for the fact that the tiles are not uh, the tile sprites are not centered in the way you might expect. So the zero, zero coordinate of any tile is not its center, but it's actually like its top middle, like visually corner. This is actually like the zero, zero, right? Because again, our axis kind of goes like this. 
So it's just to account for the fact that there's a bit of spacing between where we draw the tile, like centered, and the actual sort of root position of the tile as far as the the world is concerned. So we find out those, and then we can, uh, yeah, so we come up with these formulas, right, which is kind of exactly uh, what we've written here, and you can just arrange, rearrange these things to um, pull out the x, the y, and x like this. So it's kind of solving some equations by substitution, if you like. Um, hopefully that makes sense. If that's not clear, let me know and I can kind of go into a bit more detail. But essentially you get a pair of equations and then you can kind of solve and substitute to find, given mouse x and mouse y, you can find uh, uh, these these x and y values in the world coordinates which is a way nicer way than sort of figuring out the distance to tiles and stuff like that there's just a little bit of logic here which makes sure that if our mouse is like way off the edge of the world like if our coordinate is less than zero or if it's like greater than the size of the world then we just return null we declare our bounds um yeah so that's where we are it gives us this nice thing I think this is off slightly what's going on there maybe when i added that hand i did something weird with the positioning of these things let me Yeah, it's kind of off slightly. What's going on there? Did I like recenter the tiles or something? That's better. There we go. Yeah, I think the offset was wrong for some reason. Um, okay. So what's next, right? So that, those are the changes I've made. We now have this world still, which is drawn on which we can sort of edit. Um, when we create the world, right now it's filled with water, which is kind of weird. I'm going to change it to have grass first. Think. And then we can talk about how to turn this into an actual game. Like, what do we actually want this game to be? Um, as I said, if anyone in chat has any thoughts or suggestions about what we should actually do with this, then I am open to suggestions. But I had a little idea, which was how about making this like a, a sort of map drawing game, if you like, or a tube connecting game. I don't know what the name is for these. It's something you see quite often. I feel like often this is like the hacking mini game you get in certain things. I kind of want something where... Okay, I'm fed up of drawing stuff in an isometric pattern, so I'm just going to... Forgive me as I draw this like in a regular grid, just because it's going to be easier to explain the gameplay logic I'm thinking of. So we're going to define a grid. this. I'm conscious I spend a lot of my time in these streams drawing grids. Maybe I should automate this somehow, get some prefab grids, prefab grids ready in advance. Okay, add a new layer here. So we've got this grid and you can imagine doing something like trying to connect points with roads or rivers on this grid. So maybe you've got point A and then point B somewhere. And maybe your task is to kind of connect these things 
of appropriate tiles, so something like this. Um, and the way we could do this is we could give the player like a set of tiles to start with, like maybe they have like a like a right bend, like a, a straight line, a few straight lines, some like straight lines going in the other direction, one of these, one of these, <laughs> you know, a palette of things that they can use, and then maybe the task is for them to like click and drag these things or some other interaction to kind of put these things onto the map in order to make a path between A and B, which uses all of these tiles. That's kind of what I'm thinking about. Um, I think there's other tweaks we could think about to that, like maybe... God, my tablet really doesn't like to play nice with this. What is going on? Maybe um, only some of these tiles would be like preset and the rest could be there's something really, really weird with this tablet where it goes into some weird mode, which I don't understand. Right, like maybe this starts with like a handful of tiles pre-placed and you have to build your road or build your river with those like locked tiles. So this is another variation. Either we just give them enough things and they just have to use them all or we give them like a... Oh. <laughs> Wrong brush size. Or we give them like some pre-placed tiles and a pre-placed like start and end point and they have to connect the things up. So yeah, so that's kind of what I'm thinking about doing here. Uh, in terms of how we implement this, I think there's a few steps. I think we probably need to be able to... We're going to need to define these levels somehow. So probably like save and load maps. be a nice feature and it means we can start off like making some uh, some of these maps and making some nice terrains that the players can play in the next thing is I guess the UI for placement see what I mean there's something really weird with this tablet which I do not understand ah, I'm not touching anything Another thing we're going to have to do is to validate the map, right? So right now this is not valid because you have a river which just ends in the middle of nowhere. You have this thing which obviously wants to be connected to something, but it's not connected. Whereas if this was connected in a sensible way, whatever that may be, then that's probably valid. So we need a way to check that everything's connected properly. That's one thing. So check connections, or or check validity. I think I'll say. And the second thing is checking that if the map's valid, does it actually um, connect the points which we want the player to connect? Which are kind of two separate things, right? You might have a a valid river, but it might just go straight past B. You know, something like that. So check connectivity, I guess, or reachability. Is that maybe a more technical term. So the first one is the other tiles placed in a legal way, and the second one is do the tiles actually create a path between the things we care about? And this will get to a bit of like graph theory stuff, um, if that's something you're familiar with. If not, maybe this would be a cool introduction to some graph theory this is super super common in any kind of game development pretty much it's used for ai and pathfinding and yeah this kind of logic so let's start with saving and loading i believe there is a previous project we did where we did some saving and loading and we used the library to do that called json most likely Okay. So I'm just going to copy this out. So it looks like to add a library, you create a code folder and then put the library inside there. This is Google's JSON library, JSON being a format for like saving and loading stuff from text files, which is exactly what we want to do here. 
so it's kind of cheating maybe but a reasonable way to do it i think we may need to restart this for the editor to realize it's been dropped in there Cool. And you know what? Let's open the previous project so we can remember the syntax we're using JSON. This is the kind of thing that you always need to memorize. You can, you know, you do it once or you check Stack Overflow or Wikipedia and you can find out how this stuff is done. Now I'm guessing which one is the folder I've already created. Nope. I want the old one so I can peek into my old, ah, so I can peek into my old code and uh, remember how to use this library. So it looks like we do import like that. And then, okay, simple as that, right? We say new JSON and then we can take a string. Okay, yeah, this is kind of the exact code, code we kind of want there. Somewhere in the setup. So I need our import. Bet there was a save. Let's find that. Cool. Do I have a handy way to do this? Okay. So literally just a couple of lines we can kind of load and save objects from disk. Um, but we should probably define some classes or structures to hold this thing. So I'm thinking that we are going to have a something like a list of worlds where each world has a grid. It then has a set of available tiles and it also has placements for the start and end points, something like that. Or maybe just we'll have a certain special tile that represents the start and represents the end. I don't know. Um, but let's create a kind of class for this anyway. So call it map. What does a map have? A map has whatever we currently have in our map, which is just an array of integers like that. Um, So for now that's probably just fine. And let's have let's call this our library. And our library is gonna have all the games data. There's other stuff that will be in here in the future, right? So to do like start target tiles. A little pool of available tiles. Our library is simply going to have a list of maps. List of maps. Yeah, precision is kind of weird with that stuff. Now I realize map is kind of a <laughs> kind of a reserved word or a common uh, class name already in Java, so I'm going to change this to a level. Okay, so the library has a list of levels. Okay. So let us have a variable here for library. Should probably have current level variable and what I think I will do is try and load our library um, so when we start our library is probably going to be empty right so I'm going to say if if the list of levels is empty then let's just add a new level It's 
sorry. <laughs> so juvenile, okay. The library contains nothing, let's just start put a new blank level in there. And then let's just say that our current level is going to be just the first level in our library. Okay. Should probably interesting these don't match, is that correct? I'm not sure. Let's do something where if a if maybe S, no. Yeah, okay, S. If S for save is pressed, then I'm gonna save our libraries. Save our library, rather. Kind of going through this quickly. This is a very common starter thing to do. Again, if there's any questions about this, then do let me know. What does this do? It says when we press the S key, we're gonna take our library and convert it into a JSON text representation. There are some just very op various options we set here. Pretty printing means this when this is in text form, it won't be all like crunched into a single line with no spaces. It will be nicely spaced out, a bit like this code actually. And we'll be able to see shortly what that looks like. Um, so instead of world here, it's going to be current levels world. Same here, the current level world. Um, is there any other place where we refer to that? And it's going to error out. Oh, I've just actually noticed there are little highlights here. Used to from other IDEs, but I did not realize processing did. Which allow you to see sort of a little map of your code where the errors are, which is actually quite handy. Yeah, and then you can jump to those, that's nice. Did not realize processing did that for you. Okay, probably if I run this, it's going to fail because the library file does not exist. Yeah, the file is missing or accessible. Let's create it in that case. Um, where are we? Look at the data. So it's going to be library.json. Okay, it's opened in my text editor. I happen to know that the JSON for like an empty thing is just braces with nothing in between. Let's see a bit for you. Okay. Hopefully now if you run this it should work. It will find an empty library more or less. Um, so then it's going to decide to add a new empty level which should just be filled with grass. Let's see if that works as expected. Nope. Um, what happened there? Is it because I did not say levels can be an empty list? I would have expected it to default that anyway. Boom. Okay. That appears to have worked. If I now press S for save, and hopefully it's written that file, I should be able to reload this. And there we go. There is our world in a painfully verbose form. <laughs> and the problem with setting that pretty print mode is it went a little bit too pretty and it's exploded this to be crazily sized. I bet if I turn that off though it would be uh, too small. I mean too too crunched down. Let's have a look. I mean it's not like we're going to be editing this file manually so it's really not an issue. Okay, that's like super crunched down and everything will go on one line. There's no middle ground here apparently. Um, you know, let's, let's go pretty print because at least then I can, in my editor, you know, I can save this. 
and then I can like collapse things in here so you know I can collapse the world down which can be handy okay yeah that's pretty good for me um should build a map time to just have some fun with this and build something of forestry mountain mountainous region here the some road i have to scroll through every single time in order to do this by the way this is not the most user-friendly editor but it does kind of work for our purposes at least so always a question, how long do you let yourself live with like a really janky editor, given that you know you're not going to have to use it for that long? And when do you take the time to actually code it up properly and have like a palette of tiles or some UI overlay or something to make this more reasonable? Okay, now I can press S to save this. If I reload you can see there are some other numbers in here which i trust correspond to those tiles now if i close the program and open it again boom our world has been loaded so i think we can officially say point one here is complete we can now save and load these maps let's think about now um what this little placement UI might look like. How can we do this? Okay. Hmm. So I could have a, like a bar or things at the bottom. I could use key. <laughs> I could be really janky and use the keyboard numbers, right? Like list, like number the different tile types. If you're using roads, then there's probably check how many pieces there are. We don't need these watery roads. One, two, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Okay, there's fifteen, so those don't really nicely map the keys, so I think we need some kind of mouse dealy going on, so maybe we What could we do? We could have it so when you click a tile, a little thing pops up, and then you click within the little pop-up what you want to place. Or maybe if you want to dig up the tile and return it to your little um, pool of tiles, um, we could display something like always at the top and just have you, rather than like scrolling through here, maybe you would scroll through your little palette, and then whenever you click, it would just place that, and then whenever you right-click, it would uh, replace it with grass. That that will probably do. That's probably the way to do this. So let's uh, write some code to kind of draw this UI. So um, we probably need. So what I want here is kind of a, an array of integers, which are the IDs of all the tiles which are placeable for us, which are basically these road type tiles. So one way to do that, which is kind of ugly, <laughs> but should work at least. You know what? Okay. Let's do it. Like 
this. Then we can do, do something like... care about. We can maybe tweak the order of these later if it seems not sensible. There are the names of the things we want. So now I can just say I can loop over these. And I can now find the index of these. Um, A little bit janky but what I'm doing here is defining the names of all the tiles I care about and then I'm going through this this array to find the locations of them because it's the index in here which I really need to be able to draw them and stuff like that so I'm looking at the index by checking that the names match and then I'm storing the index in this thing which is ultimately what's going to define our kind of palette of tiles if you like so to draw these what I want to do so they're kind of going to appear at the top of the screen so I just want to draw them with a bit of kind of spacing like this at the top of the screen so to do that I'm going to start they're going to be at a certain y position and they're going to start at a certain x position and there's going to be a certain step with each one as we go across and I'll hopefully just squeeze them all in at the top row so And I'm kind of guessing at numbers here. Very arbitrary. So for I'll loop over all of these. Um, and then I'm going to do something like uh, this. So this is looking up the image for that tile. I'm going to draw it at the relevant X and Y position. step across like that so the next one will be drawn uh, kind of in a slightly different position the problem with processing syntax highlighting there sometimes it screws up um, so we draw the background we draw this we draw the world okay so here's something interesting I don't want the camera offset to apply to this little UI stuff right like when we draw the UI as we move the camera, the, the UI shouldn't scroll around with it. So we apply this translate so that the world is drawn offset by the camera's position. We kind of want to undo that to draw the UI kind of after here, right? 
So if I just draw this like this, we'll, we'll, we'll see the effect. Okay, the, the spacing's are wrong, but you get the idea, right? This is not, <laughs> this is not exactly ideal. So instead we should, well, one thing we could do is translate back by the negative of this, but that's kind of hacky. A nice way to do that is to use these push matrix and pop matrix functions. And what these do is they, any translation type stuff you do, it's like a save and restore for the position of stuff basically. And it's a way to have those changes uh, apply here, but then sort of undo them here. And you can do this multiple levels. The way, reason it's called push and pop is because this kind of uses, it's kind of like an undo stack. So pushing stuff onto the undo stack and then popping it back off or sort of undoing it. Okay, so clearly our scaling is way out and these things need to be much smaller. Um, so let's actually do a Like this. Definitely too small. Um, interestingly, the scaling will apply to uh, uh, the movement as well. Um, so there are ways around that, but the easiest way is just to it's kind of hacky, but the easiest way is probably just to increase these values. Almost there, just need a little bit more. Okay, let's just up the step slightly. Okay, let's go <laughs> scale them down a little bit more. I'm just going to tweak these until it looks kind of right. Almost there. Clearly not quite enough. I mean that. I mean that's maybe okay. They're still all kind of visible there. I don't know. Let's do it slightly, slightly nicer. Thirty. Don't forget your semicolons, kids. Okay, there they all, all laid out across the top there. That seems pretty reasonable to me. Um, now let's have the idea of being able to like highlight these things. So... I selected tile type. Let's say... So previously, when we mouse wheel, we apply these changes directly to the tile we're hovering over. I think what we can do instead is... Uh, hmm. I was thinking for the game, yeah, we definitely don't want to do this, but for building the map, we could probably do... Maybe we could have modes. Should we do that? Let's do like an editor mode. mode is true. Let's have this toggled by a certain button. Let's have the save only work in the editor mode. OK, 
Okay. Let's if. If we're not in editor mode. Okay, let's just make it draw game UI because it's not just the UI, it's the it's the UI that's not relevant to the editor, so it's game UI as opposed to like editor UI. Um, okay, and then we can have slightly different behavior here, right? So I say if if it's editor mode, then we're gonna use the same logic as we had before, where we're directly changing tiles on the map by scrolling. Else, if we are not in editor mode, then we're just gonna. this exact thing here. So the idea here is if we're in the editor then we can edit the map directly by scrolling over it using the scroll wheel over it. If we're not, if we're in the game itself, then we're just going to change our selection at the top of the screen and it will be clicking, which actually does the deal of uh, uh, actually placing a tile. And in fact, I can do that here. When the mass is pressed, let's get the hover tile. So this is if we're not in editor mode. Even just say not in editor mode return. That's often a nicer I my preferred way of doing this. Rather than nesting everything inside an if, just bail out if you can early. Um and then I'm gonna say world. going to be equal to whatever we have selected, right? So it's not selected tile type, it's that's just the index. So we need to look up in our little menu based on the index. Okay, bit of a mess. Last thing I want to do is I want to highlight these things, highlight the one we've got selected. So I'm going to say change this loop because I'm going to need to check the index. switching this to an old school kind of for loop then let's see if we can apply a tint here right so if equal to and I'm gonna tint it I don't know green <laughs> uh, I'm not great with colors otherwise we're gonna draw it in white Okay, hopefully this gives us the behavior we expect. Okay, right now I can scroll around. That's nice. If I press E to switch to editor, then that's not quite working as I expected. I expected things to be highlighted at the top. What's going on here?
it's backwards. I noticed I was clicking there and it was placing stuff, and it should be in this mode, right? Okay, it appears to be working, it's just the highlight is wrong. Maybe because of the... Oh! Okay. I chose, I chose a terrible colour. You can see this is kind of yellowy. As I scroll along, it is actually changing. Like, this one's highlighted. Now this one is. I just need to choose a colour which is more visible. I guess the tones, like the greens and browns on that tile, don't uh, display the tint very well. So, red seems to be very visible. So let's do that. Okay. Okay. Now I can place that down. I can scroll through and I can place down different junctions. This is actually a way nicer way to, <laughs> to edit than the previous one. Um, okay, we've already got a nicer map editor. <laughs> Although with a somewhat limited tile palette, this seems pretty, pretty neat. So I can place these things down just fine. So... It really probably should show me like on the map, right? Rather than showing this, it should uh, show me the uh, the tar which I've got highlighted. So something like if we're not in the editor. I'm going to say, you know, preview preview the tower back to place, so tile type is actually going to be okay which means that now if I switch to this mode, then yeah that's much better. Now I can scroll through. Oh yeah, that's way nicer. Cool. So that is all good. All done. Okay. So we now have our placement UI in place. Next thing is to check for validity of the map. So we had kind of defined validity as Um, if we're placing roads, right, then validity means that we don't have any, like, roads which end in nowhere and every road needs to connect up to its neighbours properly. So I think there's a fairly straightforward way we can think about this, which is that for any given tile, we can look at its immediate neighbours to figure out if those seem sensible. So... And in fact, we only need to care about the uh, up, down, left, right neighbors, I believe. What is going on with I really, really don't understand, and it's kind of bothering me. But in any case, we only care about the little T-shape around us, if you like. At least for these tiles, like some of the weird corner edgy tiles are a bit different, but for the road, it's all very nice, nice and uniform. What we can basically do is we can say, hey, if I'm if I'm a road piece like this, uh, get my brush out. If I'm a road piece like like this, wow, that's terrible. Okay, <laughs> if I'm a piece like this then I need my neighbors to continue, right? They must also connect to my sides like that. And if it connects like that, then that's no good. So basically by storing whether I'm connected to my like north, east, south, and west, I can say, you know, if I'm a tile here, which has an east connection, then 
the tower to my east should have a west connection, right? Otherwise, we're not going to like marry up properly. Or in another example, if I'm at like a T junction, then it means that I now connect like east, south, and west. And my east neighbor should also connect, have a west connection and so on, right? They should have their opposite pairing should kind of line up and that should mean that things are all valid. So I can now implement a little function which will just check whether a level is valid. So let's throw it in here, seems a reasonable place. So is valid. Right, this is kind of what we're looking at. So one thing we need to do is define for each of these roads um, what their connections are, right? Um, and I've drawn this like this, but again, in reality, it's kind of this shape. And due to the way the coordinate system work, this is north east south and west so we kind of need to tag each of these tiles with their neighbor information if you like so let's just define that in here let's map from make actually a little enum here so an enum being something which can have only a fixed set of values so it's a little type which can have north east south 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 and west so we should go from a string to a An array of directions. I'd like this to be a static thing. So the way processing works, it's got some weirdness with static, so it probably won't like that. So, hmm. don't really want to just throw this all in the main class, but I may may have to do so. You know what, I can just do it in a function here. I can recreate this every time, it's not actually a big deal. Okay, so let's start populating this, right? So I'm going to need my list of tile types uh, that we care about. And I can start filling these in, which is going to be a somewhat manual process, I'm afraid. So here's our little list. And it's, each line is kind of going to look like this. direction and I can put something like this a bit like that cool okay I don't need to say that because it all works the same so I can put a kind of list in like that and now I'm kind of just specifying a big mapping of one of these things 
Awesome. So I think what I will do is I will try and get my uh, get both windows on screen at the same time. Okay, what I may do, I'm going to have this on the other monitor so you guys won't be able to see it, but I'm just going to be looking and going, okay, this connects like east and west. This connects like north and south. I'm just going to fill all those in with reference to these images and these file names. So not the most exciting couple of minutes, but I'm going to have to shoot through this. So let me just put... these names in Whew, okay. It's very hard to type. So the order I'm putting them in here within these things doesn't matter at all. Five is the big old full crossroads. Let me have these little endpoints. Just connects to the east. Connects to the south. Just connects to the west. And just connects to the north. Okay, that's the connectivity information we have there. Okay, it doesn't like those, it wants it to be like this, right? Okay, let's do some find and replace here. Ah! This is not the ideal place for this stuff to be, like ideally this would be in some config file or something, some like tile database, but I'm just kind of hacking this in, so this is fine for me for now. Okay, here's our big <laughs> Now, how do we validate a world? We sort of just iterate over the entire world, which I'll copy this loop since we do that so many times. Um.
So now we know the name of this tile type, we can now look it up in this nice array, or this map brother, um, its connectivity. So it's possible it's not in this. If it's not a road, then it's not going to be in this list. So we kind of don't care about it. So if this is null, then just skip this tile. Otherwise, we need to sort of check neighbors. Mm, and let's create another little utility function for this. idea being we can do something like fill this implementation in later um so for so check everything in the tile connectivity we need another switch So if we expect a connection to the north, um, so our neighbor to the north is at the same x, and then the y is our y minus one, and it requires a connection to the south, right? So if we have a connection going north ways, it means our the neighbor to our north or our neighbor at x, y minus one, that should have a connection going to the south so that they can marry up. If that's not the case, then we've immediately failed, right? Like this is invalid. The, the whole world is now invalid because there is a road tile which does not look good. So we can return false like that. Okay, now similarly for east. Our easterly neighbor is at x plus 1 and y. It should have a west connection. Otherwise, things are not looking too good. South is going to be at x, y plus 1. It should have a connection to its north. North. Currently, west is at x minus 1, y. It should have an east connection. Okay, how do we implement this? So we probably actually need to also give it this uh, connectivity data, because annoyingly it's defined here rather than kind of statically, just because of a quirk of processing, so I'm going to pass that in as well. And also here, we need to get passed to this function every time we call it. Okay, uh, now what does this logic look like? So first of all, it's possible that, that we're out of bounds, right? That our neighbor is off the edge of the map, and if the neighbor is off the edge of the map, it doesn't exist, and so it clearly doesn't connect to us properly. So if, uh, I think we had some code for out of bounds before, which we can use. I believe it's in the hovered tile code. Yeah. So if the neighbor is out of bounds, We're going to return false. 
Otherwise, um, we need to do something similar to this. Yep, yep, same thing. It's null, then obviously doesn't have the connection we hoped for. Otherwise, we're going to return. Um, Um, is there an array contains I can use? Okay. We're looking for a match, right? So it's told us, hey, I want this tile at X, Y to have a connection in this particular direction. We've now pulled out, based on the type of this tile, the directions it connects in. So now we just need to check if this is in that list, right? this is equal to that and return true we found the match we do connect in the direction we hoped otherwise if we get through that whole list and we haven't found the thing we're looking for then I'm gonna return false so okay <laughs> this is a bit messy so what we're doing we're looking through the whole world we're looking at the type of each tile if it's not a row tile or not in our list of tiles with connections then we don't care about it otherwise we check for every direction which we should connect in. So if it's this road which runs east to west, we're going to check our neighbor to our east and our neighbor to our west. And then they should have the kind of reciprocal connection. So our neighbor to the east should have a west connection because that will allow us to marry up with it. If any of those connections are missing on any tile, then we immediately return false because the world is not valid. But if we get to the very end of the world, then return true, right? The world is valid if there are no invalid tile placements on it, basically. So to test this out, let's add a little thing here saying, uh, let's add a little validate thing here. And then do, um, right, we're just gonna print this out. Uh, that's a lot, whole lot of code I've written before since run it last running anything, so there's a good chance there's a couple bugs in here. There's also a significant chance that I mistyped <laughs> some of this connection information and it doesn't quite map up with the uh, road tile shapes and the things they will connect to, but we shall see. Okay, this looks valid to me because you can kind of tell visually the road has the borders all make sense. And we got a null pointer exception. Very interesting. What is the tile type and how did it become <laughs> something invalid? Hmm. That's very interesting. Is this wrong? There's another time we look up the world. Okay. Okay, it is X, Y like that. Okay. That can't be it though, right? I think everything in there should be valid. Y, X. So what's null here? Let's throw the debugger on and see what the heck is happening. Uh, 
step tile type is 2 tile assets should definitely be defined hmm Do, do I do anything weird like null this out somewhere? So annoyingly it's not really showing me uh, this thing. So it's not picking up the scope correctly, and I'm not seeing this thing even though it's kind of within global scope, so it makes it slightly awkward. Oh, okay. Hmm. I'm wondering how this could have become zero, become null, sorry. Debugging the most exciting Twitch content. Okay, there we go, that worked. So if I do this, we hopefully see you. false. Awesome. I choose another. Uh, I choose another road layout. That is valid. I should think that invalid. Okay, it's saying false. If I curl it back around in some sensible way, then hopefully. Will identify the fact that this is a valid road layout. You know, if I play Carcassonne, like a tile placing board game, it's very much the same concept, right? You need the tiles to kind of visually line up. So this shouldn't work because there's a weird like edge going on there. So yep, it says false. If I replace that with normal road, it says true. Okay. I think we may have done this I just okay one way to check that this is working is to make sure we have a map which includes every like type of tile so let's make sure that's there and then make sure that all these end caps are on there let's turn this into a t-junction let's put this here so the rule is kind of very simple we're kind of iterating over every tile and then we're just checking um, you know, this tile would expect a neighbor to the east, and that neighbor should have a connection going to the west. So we'll check this tile, it will say, do you have a westward connection? It will say yes, and now this tile is happy. 
this tile is going to say, hey, I should have a neighbor to my east this way, to my south this way, and to my west that way. So we'll check this tile, which should have a west connection, which it does, and so on. And just by doing that for every tile, we can essentially validate that the entire world is sensible and correct. And if I could scroll to the bottom here, it says true. Yeah, I think we have managed to create a sensible, kind of valid world. Um, yeah, let's get rid of that print line statement we're going to need. Okay, so the world is valid, which is very handy and awesome. So we can cross one more thing off of our list, which is validity. Okay, we now know that we have a valid world. Final thing here is reachability. Um, and if you recall, reachability is saying if we define a certain start tile and end tile, that whatever network we've drawn should actually connect those things up. So um, let's think about how we would do that. We probably need some like floating marker to indicate that this is a start or an end tile. So let's hop over to open game art and see what we can find. And these assets, if you remember, were from the Kenny asset packs. So I'm going to search for more of those. See if we can get a suitable indicator. Yeah, there's loads of these. Let's pull out some and try and find some suitable objects. Uh, this is the set we used. Oh no, it's not. So there's a flat. There's a slightly different, right? Our, our roads are sort of 3D, so this won't quite mesh. Okay, this is the set we were using originally. Is it? Almost. I think it's missing. No, no. Okay, this, this. I think this is the set we were using. Oh, uh, yeah. There's no like buildings or landmarks we could use for this. So let's try and find something else. What I'm looking for is like a little house or something. Something which would serve as an indicator, or like a flag, or you know, something like that. Okay, this is a bit more like it. That's cool. We can build with these sets. Okay, I'm going to download this. And I'm going to check something else. Oh, vehicles make sense, right? If we're doing a a road thing. Um, Oh, okay, this looks like some placeable objects which could also work. Okay, these little house dealies. Those seem like a really good option. I'm kind of assuming they're the same size. If not, I can probably chop them out. Especially these houses, right? Since they're not full tiles, I'm sure I'll be able to overlay them nicely enough. And the task for the player can just be connect all the houses together, right? So let's go for these open this thing up and let's pull out some of these towers the red ones seem nice pick which kind of tower artwork we like i feel like something more homely and house-like might work for us Kenny's been busy, there's there's a lot of these. Um Yeah, that's kind of what I'm looking for. Let me details. Okay, I'm gonna extract all of these things. So 
so we can see the thumbnails and browse through them a bit more easily. Anything here? Ah, nice as they are. I don't think we need those. All those. Okay, something like this is going to work for me. Nice little hat. Yeah, the red ones look a bit odd. Okay, just call this tower. I'm thinking maybe having like a main tower and like a secondary tower might work. and a building. Okay, let's check that these are reasonably the same sort of size. Uh, okay. These also need to kind of visually align in the correct way. Um, okay, they are kind of small. Just put this on top so it's not quite the correct size. Let's kind of move it up so that it's going to align properly. Um, center it like this. Okay, that looks good. Prop this down. Nope. Not want to do that. Uh, just want to kind of crop it to the top. Yeah, you know what? This is fine for me. Bit of wasted space on the tile sprite, but not a big deal. We at least know it will like visually align correctly. So now let's take this one. Make sure this one fits nicely as well. Awesome. Export this tower. Do we call it tower? Okay, let's load those images. So my thought is that there'll be one tower and maybe multiple buildings and the task will be make sure the tower is connected to all of the buildings through roads. So let's load. So the building. And now we can start to define a bit better what our level contains. It contains uh, tower position and a something like a Right, so a tower position and a building position. So start off at 
Zero, zero, for example, just by default. our little levels file and we can specify in here our position it's going to be I don't know something that makes sense in our world building positions which can be like that. Seems reasonable enough. Let's check the JSON loads and we haven't misformatted our little arrays there. Okay, still loads okay. Now what I want to do is when I'm drawing the world I may also need to draw or I will also need to draw the position of uh, the buildings and stuff, right? So if x is equal to current level dot tower position zero and y position one then I'm going to draw our our uh, tower image here And then I'm also going to loop through all of the buildings. There could be several of those. And do pretty much the same deal. So what I could have just done is just sort of pull this out of this loop and just draw these things at the end, but I kind of want to draw them at the same time as the tiles so that if they're like behind the peak of a mountain, they are drawn in the correct sequence, right? If I just drew these at the end, they would always appear on top of everything else when it's possible that maybe they should be kind of slightly obscured by stuff. Um, I've got an extra bracket in here. There we go. Nice, okay. We have our things drawn as we would hope. And what I was saying with the other thing is that, you know, we want the spike of like this steel. Where is it? Come on. Where's my mountain? Yeah, right. See how it kind of obscures very slightly uh, part of the tower. If we'd have just drawn the tower and building outside of the main loop where we draw the other tiles, then they'd have got drawn kind of incorrectly sorted. Um, false. This level is definitely not valid. But if we throw this on, then I believe it should be. Cool. So that checks that the level is valid and that works okay. Next thing is reachability. Whereby if these things are all connected and basically starting at the tower position, can you now reach every building? Then you've kind of solved the level, right? Like that's how the gameplay is going to work. So I'm going to add another function here. Are the buildings connected? It's kind of be a little bit more 
complicated. This is definitely going to be a kind of craftery type deal. But I think I, I can explain relatively simply how this works. Again, going back to our map here, right? Um, kind of the way the logic will be is we're going to keep track of which tiles we've kind of checked and we're going to start with oh we're going to start at the position of the tower let's say a is the tower and b is a building maybe there's only one building what we're going to do is we're going to look at all of a's neighbors we've already by the way validated that the road system is a reasonable legal one so we don't need to be worried about like roads going off the edge of the map we don't need to check bounds or do any stuff like that anymore um so what we should probably do is say, okay, A has a neighbor to its east, so this tile is now going to be something we need to check as well. Um, and in a simple case where it's just one straight road, we can literally just follow the neighbor path through until either we reach a dead end or we touch B, right? Where it gets slightly more complicated perhaps is when there are branches. So let's say this path actually... Oh, this path actually does something like this. And even if it has a little loop in it, this is definitely something which could get... You could imagine that same algorithm, like trying to follow the path around and getting stuck in a loop. So probably as we do this, we're going to need to keep track of which tiles we visited to make sure that if we've already visited a tile, we don't ever visit it again, right? Like there could be many ways to reach B. And if you've already kind of followed this, path here then when we're following this path we, we can stop here because we've kind of already followed it um the other little wrinkle is that when there are splits we now need to kind of follow two paths at once so we probably want to keep a list of uh tiles which are kind of queued up to be explored if you like so when we start on a we're going to queue up this tile to be explored and then when and then we'll kind of go through our list of tiles to explore we'll see there's only one thing on it We'll then check this tile and it will go, okay, I connect to my west and to my south. Well, the west tile we've already seen, so we're going to ignore that. The south tile, we're going to now queue that up to be explored as well. And for the most part, it's a slightly more complicated way of just following this path. But when we get to this split, you know, let's say we've explored this tile or these. When we get to this, explore this tile, we're going to queue up this one and this one. And then... Each time we explore a new tile, we're going to check the list of sort of pending queued up tiles. Um, so maybe we go through this one first and then, you know, maybe we explore this one next and then this one and it goes in some odd order. It doesn't really matter as long as we make sure we don't miss a tile where there's a branch. And if we make sure that if we come back to a tile we've already explored, we don't explore it again. That's kind of all we need to worry about. And if we just keep doing that, eventually we'll explore this whole network and we can just keep track, you know, in the course of doing that, did I touch all of the buildings? Are there any buildings which I haven't yet discovered? So, you probably need um, this could even be a use a set for this. So, so we're going to keep track of the set of things we haven't yet discovered, and this is just going to be based on... It's going to start off with the original building positions. looking for a convenience way to construct this and add all of the building positions in but it did not like that so do it this way instead loop through all the building positions and then just add them in like one by one like this um actually there's a better way to do this so we can actually kind of do this the other way around. My thought was as we explore, we can like remove things from this list. And then if this list is, or this set is empty when we're done, then it means we've, we've at some point we've discovered everything. 
but another way is to start with this rather than keeping track of things we haven't yet touched we can say that the buildings we have reached and we can add to this and then we can just check that the size of this the number of things in this is equal to the number of buildings in the level so it does the same deal and we can avoid this initialization which is nice okay let's create a queue of tiles to visit so this is going to be remember in our example the first tile we want to visit is a and then we're going to visit anything a connects to and when there's a split when we visit this tile we're going to queue up both of its neighbors uh, to visit ah she's the list she's the linked list that's just fine Although I'm using int arrays because I'm just packing like x and y into a little array, which is kind of what I'm doing there. Okay, the first time we want to visit. Um, it makes sense to start our journey from the location of the tower and sort of spread out from there. So I'm going to add that in first. Boom. Uh, and now we're just going to set up a little loop, which is something like while... While the list of things to visit isn't empty. We're going to visit a tile, queue up its neighbors. Um, oh, we also want this, right? Tiles visited. Keep track of that, it's going to be quite important. Okay, so in. Equal to let's remove the first thing from the list, and that's what we're going to visit. So uh, let's remember that we visited it. By the way, what we're doing is kind of referred to as uh, this is a search, like a graph search algorithm. And depending on whether you, you know, I talked about how when we come to this split, we could either like check this tile, then this tile, then this tile, then this tile, or we could kind of go all the way down one branch and then try the next one. Depending on which of those you choose, it's either breadth first search, meaning you sort of check every direction sort of equally or depth first search, meaning you go down one path all the way before checking, before kind of backing up and checking the other route. Um, yeah, these are breadth first search and depth first search. Um, in our case, they're more or less equivalent. It doesn't matter which one we use. Um, but these are very, very super common algorithms for traversing something like this. You can imagine this is how Google Maps under the hood does something like this to figure out um, the path from A to B. Uh, and there's so many different applications uh, for this. What we're doing right now is with an actual physical map the graph actually corresponds to like some spatial thing, but the same technique applies in more abstract cases as well. Like if you're writing a chess AI, for example, you can consider all the different moves you make to be different branches in this graph. So it's harder to visualize, but the same actual technique can be applied to exploring possibilities of chess moves or all sorts of different things like that. So this is super, super common and useful and applicable absolutely everywhere, this kind of algorithm. Um, okay. So we actually need this. So you know what? I'm going to make a little function which generates this for us.
since we now also want to use that in our other function. Honestly, I'd have liked to pre-calculate this and store it away somewhere, but processing actually makes that kind of awkward. Um, okay. So now we can use this function here. Comment down. What's going on with the indentation there? Um, so we've done that. Um, okay, let's take this. We need that same information here. So we've got the tile, so the tile type is uh, the same thing here, right? So. Uh, in fact, let's take out x and y. It's going to be a bit more readable if we do it like this. So we're going to then look up the sort of ID, like what type is this tile? Is it grass? Is it a road? And so on. I mean, hopefully it's all roads or something's kind of gone wrong. Um, D in... Need to do the same thing. So, given the tile type, we need to look up its type name, and then given the name, we can find its connectivity. If it's not a row tile, then something's gone weird. Ah, what do we do? Yeah, something's actually gone wrong here because we should always be part of the road network as we're doing this searching for building connectivity, but. Um, so yeah, let's be a bit because we start at a row tile where the tower is, and then we all the connected tiles should also be row tiles, so this should never happen. So I'm just going to bail out and throw a big scary error because this really should not happen. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, oh, also, by the way, we can... There might be a building here, right? So let's check that. in fact found this building and we can even check here right so if that size is equal to uh, 
this is slightly annoying because this is an array, so we use dot length, whereas this is a list, so we use dot size, but you know, or a set, so we use dot size, but same deal. Ooh. Yeah. So we can early out, right? It may, be, it may be that we find all of these buildings before we've like fully explored this whole map. So maybe we find it more or less straight away, in which case if we found them all, then there's no sense like continuing to explore the whole world. So let's bail out. Um, okay. Otherwise, we're going to have to see which uh, neighbors it connects to and then queue those up for being visited next. So. North, your boss equals um, north is x and one minus one. North east is x plus one and y. South is x y plus one. West is x minus one and y. Um, yeah, then I can do something like if if we haven't already already visited this. Then we're going to add it in here. Okay, Whew. that's a lot, but I believe we have probably done what we need to do. So, what is this logic? <laughs> um, so, we first look up this big matrix saying what type of roads have what neighborly directions they connect to. Yita, welcome back. It has been a while. A long absence indeed. So, we're working on this little isometric map editor thing. Um, I'm working on turning this into a little game where the player can kind of place these road pieces and the idea is they have to connect different like pre-placed buildings and maybe some of the road segments are kind of pre-placed as well and they've got a limited like set of road bits they can use so it's like you know given this lego set and these pre-placed buildings you have to connect them all back together some kind of political theory very interesting um yeah, and we've just written some code which will check whether the user's solution, whether the player's solution is correct. In this case, it will fail because this is weird and it's not a legal road, so it will just tell us it's not valid entirely. Uh, right now, I think this is fine, and we're just updating it so it will actually check that these, uh, the tower and the buildings are all connected, which is kind of the objective. Uh, yeah, so we... we we're going to keep track of every tile we've visited. We're going to keep track of every building we've managed to find along the way. Uh, we're keep, going to keep this little queue, this list of tiles that we we need to visit in the future. And we're going to seed that off with the tower position. And then we're going to pick, arbitrarily pick something to visit from our little queue, which on the first go around will just be the tower position. So in this case, it will be this tile here. Um, we then check whether there's a building here, because if there is, then it means that we've uh, landed on a building, basically. Um, we want to keep track of that. And in fact, if we've the number of buildings we've reached is equal to the number of buildings on the map, then it means we've actually managed to discover everything. No worries. See ya. See ya. Um, now we need to, we need to kind of figure out. How we're going to continue exploring this world so we look up the type of the tile and that gives us a list of this thing here which is kind of a list of all the directions in which it connects so actually this one connects in like to the east to the west and to the north it looks like it's kind of a bit obscured can't super easily tell um then we kind of go through and queue up all of our neighbors to be visited unless of course we've already visited them we don't want to visit them twice 
And I think that should be it, right? If we get to the end of this list, it means that our the end of this loop, sorry, it means that our list of things to visit is empty, which means we've visited every tile on our, our road network. And if the player has solved the thing properly, then we'd have expect we'd have already expected to hit this line, right? So if we get to the end of the loop, it means we didn't touch every building, so we can actually return false because they failed to uh, connect the buildings properly. So let's now tweak our code to actually call this. So let's do something like And once we get this to work, I think that's where I'll stop the stream for today. We may need to pick this up in a second part to actually add some more gameplay logic and progression and stuff like that. Right now, the player has unlimited tiles to place, which isn't quite right. So to make this really a game, I think it's worth doing a little bit more structure. So if I press V, we'll see. Probably, okay, probably we've... It stopped printing, which almost certainly means I've stuck us in an infinite loop somewhere. So let's check where that might have happened. And we'll probably need the debugger to solve this. Because I would have expected that to finish relatively quickly. Hmm. You know what, let's add a breakpoint here and try and debug this quickly. Uh, okay, we're actually in this is valid code, which we don't really care about. Let's continue running. Okay, now in our nice buildings connected code, we initialize these lists. We add one thing to our list of tiles to visit. Which currently has one thing only in it. So we pick one out. We've got our tile to visit right now, which is 3 3, which I think was our building location. Our tower location. Yep, that makes sense. Now we pull out its X and Y. We check if there are any buildings there. There aren't in this case. Um, yep. We put out the tile type, we put out the tile type name, which is road T4, which I think lines up with what we expected. Yeah, that's some kind of T junction, and road T4 is this one. Okay, yep, that, that definitely makes sense. That's the kind of shape here, even though it's kind of obscured. Pull out the connectivity, it should be three different directions. So we're going to loop through all of those. So our neighbor position is. Where are we? Three, two. Okay, this is still making sense to me. We add it to our list of things to visit. So our three neighbors are queued up. So now our tiles to visit should have three things in it, which it does. So we're going to pick one of those. Probably if there's a bug, it's causing us to re-queue up the tile we were just on because of some issue with this tiles visited list or something. Um, if there's a bug, that's probably what's going to be the cause of it. Yeah, this debugger is really horrible at inspecting variables. It's pretty much unusable, unfortunately. It basically doesn't understand these Java types like maps and sets and doesn't give you an intuitive view of them. It just shows you all the guts of how they're implemented internally, which a better IDE would kind of be able to interpret for you. Okay, are there buildings there? We shouldn't think so. Check the connectivity. Okay, so when we get to south, if 
currently we're on north and we should expect it to knock you up it's uh it's neighbor again so that gets queued up next direction is west so that's fine you can queue up your west neighbor that's not a problem now when you reach south you should hopefully find that the visited tile list already contains that. And you didn't, okay. That is definitely the cause of the bug, so I'm going to stop debugging, and it's something going wrong there. Is it because... the hash set doesn't like an integer array? Is that an issue? Ah, uh, okay. This is the issue. Okay, the problem is that int arrays do not play nice with these set collections, so you, the wonderful thing about a hash set is it stops you putting duplicates in, but it can't tell that two arrays which have the same values in them are actually duplicates so uh, one kind of hacky way around this is to instead use string representations which this should not be an issue for this is something you kind of need to look out for it's kind of getting into the guts of java why this is the case but kind of beyond the scope of this to explain exactly why this is but it's to do with how the hashing and internals of these data structures work, then it just does not properly support uh, these things. Okay. So instead of putting the actual coordinates into these things I'm using to check, I'm just going to put in a string version. And it will be able to tell if these strings are duplicated. And the strings are just going to be like the coordinates in x, y form. This is the kind of bug I could see somebody not familiar with Java spending days like trying to get to the bottom of, but it's just something you have to be aware of. The whole hash code equals debacle in Java. Okay, that appears to have done what we had hoped. Let's augment this to connect to our building. Boom. So in this case, it should be invalid, but it should be connected. I don't want to actually let it run if it's not valid. I think that could cause an issue. So, oh yeah, look at that. Awesome. We have made something happen. Let me, uh... this will probably crash, right? The problem is running this connectivity check if the thing isn't valid. If you put a road like going off the edge, it would probably throw some it would probably crash. So let me put something here which should let's make this valid but not connected again. Throw this in invalid and it's not connected throw this bit of road in it's all valid it's all good okay i think that's where we'll leave the stream for tonight this gives us the bones of this it allows us to have the user place these things down it allows us to check that they've actually solved the level that's kind of exactly what this is doing um solve the level meaning this tower is connected by a, a legal road network to one of these buildings um i think what we'd have to do is to have like a limited stock of these things because uh, so, right now there's no challenge i can just build whatever road i want and it's it's trivially easy to like make a solved solution to the level but if these were limited in number and you had to use certain curves and stuff you would kind of have to figure out 
you know, there'd be only certain valid solutions which you'd need to figure out. So implementing that, maybe having some tiles like pre, some of them locked in, which you can't change, and then other bits of road you have to fill in to connect everything up, uh, and then making a few levels with those constraints, I think that would give us a neat little game here to play around with. Also, yeah, in this editor mode, being able to move the buildings around to, in order to design the levels. Real stretch goal, I think, would be to randomly generate these levels, which would be quite possible, I think. But to make it generate interesting levels is something else. Uh, yeah, I was already thinking a little bit in my head about how we would do that. I think it's fairly easy to generate a, a legal road network, right? You just sort of randomly... You start with one segment of road and you just randomly add neighboring pieces. Um, and then you could kind of just delete some of them and put those into the player's little stock and then that would kind of constitute a level. Um, maybe we'll get around to doing that. Uh, maybe not. But yeah, in any case, it was pretty successful. Pretty algorithm heavy. So we did like a... Checking the validity of this whole network. We did some kind of pathfinding or like searching navigating around and searching through this entire road network here and even though it's kind of complicated the amount of code is nothing too crazy actually um so i think we'll maybe pick this up next time or at least in some kind of future stream yeah uh until then follow us on twitch and youtube and all of the places check out our twitter where we post polls for these regularly and you can maybe have a vote on the next topic yeah, but thanks so much for watching and I will catch you next time.